The 19th century Christian author and Russian philosopher Fyodor Dostoevsky once wrote, The mystery of human existence lies not in just staying alive, but in finding something to live for. I'm convinced that all human striving ultimately serves that end, to find and fulfill the purpose and meaning of life. And so along the way, of course, we inevitably ask some big questions like, what are we here for? Why do we exist? What is the meaning of life? And on and on it goes, because innately I think we all long for something bigger than just ourselves, something that transcends our daily routines and the meeting of our immediate needs, something more than just staying alive. And so it is good and it is right for us to ask these deep, probing questions at times in our lives. The fact is, there are few things more noble than the earnest search for true meaning and real purpose. And yet, for all of our striving to find ultimate fulfillment, we may be asking the wrong questions. Because as Christians, of course, we know that the ultimate fulfillment is found in Christ alone. And yet, there are an awful lot of Christians today who are dissatisfied with their lives and struggle with deep feelings of discontent and unfulfillment. Why is that? If fulfillment is to be found only in Christ, then why aren't all Christians fulfilled? Well, first of all, it's not because of God. He's not what's keeping you from living a fulfilled life. Second, it's not the enemy. And if you're truly in Christ, the enemy has no authority over you. Third, it's not because of other people, no matter how much you may believe that it's because of someone else that your life is not what or where it should be today. It's not because no one else can keep you from being the man or woman you were created to be. And so if it's not God keeping you from being fulfilled, and it's not the enemy keeping you from being fulfilled, and it's not other people keeping you from being fulfilled, then who is it? Who's keeping you from living the life that you were specifically designed and created and gifted and equipped to live? Well, the answer to that question can only be found in a mirror. Because ultimate fulfillment is only attainable by living the life you were specifically crafted by God to live. And the only person alive who can keep you from living that life is you. So yes, fulfillment is found in Christ as you respond to his call on your life. First to the call of salvation, of course, and then to the ongoing call to live according to his created order for your life which is key, you understand. This is why so many Christians struggle with feelings of discontentment and a lack of fulfillment in their lives today because they are resisting the created order that Christ has called them to. From the creation story in Genesis 1 right on through to the end of Revelation, we see Christ calling that which is in chaos into order. In fact, it's a theme that runs like a thread throughout all of Scripture. We saw it in our story last week as Jesus calmed the wind and the waves in a great storm on the Sea of Galilee. And we're going to see it again this morning as he casts a legion of demons out of a horribly possessed man. And listen, you can find it happening in people's lives all around the world today. Christ calling men and women out of spiritual chaos into his created order. And so listen, even as Christians, when we resist Christ and His leading in our lives, we're not just resisting His desire for our lives. You understand, we're also resisting the spiritual order where contentment and fulfillment reside. Because contentment and fulfillment cannot reside in spiritual chaos. And so it's no wonder so many Christians feel discontent and unfulfilled today because when we resist the leading of Christ, we're actually choosing chaos over order in our own lives, and then we wonder why we're so unhappy. If you, if you distill true contentment and fulfillment in someone's life down to its very essence, 
what you will find is someone who has responded positively to Christ's created order in their lives. And of course, the opposite is also true, which we'll see in our story today as we continue our sermon series, working our way through the gospel according to Mark, where Jesus once again calls order out of chaos. And interestingly, in addition to uh, the disciples, there are three different sets of people who also experience the same encounter with Jesus as well. And what is so compelling about that is how differently they each respond to the very same encounter. While they're equally as sincere, equally as passionate, and equally as resolute in how they respond, their actual responses cannot be more different from one another. It's the same Jesus. It's the same encounter. It's the same circumstances with completely different responses from those who are there, and it exposes the great chasm between chaos and order in people's lives. And it all starts with a question. A question, believe it or not, from the legion of demons in the story who asked Jesus, what have you to do with me? Which is actually the question that every one of us should be asking of him as well. Jesus, what do you want with me? Because you see, the answer to that question is the only thing. Listen, that is the only thing that will ever bring order into your life. So look, if you want to experience true fulfillment, then forget about what are we here for, or why do we exist, or what is the meaning of life, and instead just go straight to that question. Jesus, what have you to do with me? You ask him that question, and then you'd better prepare yourself for the answer you're going to get, because I guarantee you it will not fall into line with whatever you have planned for your life already. It won't be easily accomplished with the skills and resources you already have. And it will not come without a fight. The truth is, following Jesus Christ will be the greatest challenge of your life. And yet as disruptive as God's plan always is to our own plans. When you ask that question and then respond to him by embracing his answer instead of resisting it, no matter how much upheaval it may bring into your life, ultimately your life will come into alignment with his created order. And I'm telling you, there is no sweeter taste than the satisfaction and fulfillment that only comes when you respond to that question by saying yes to whatever he has ordered for your life. And so today we're going to continue this story as Jesus and his disciples finally reach the opposite shore on the Sea of Galilee after a long night of battling through the chaos of a horrendous storm only to be confronted with yet another great challenge as we'll see. There's a lot to learn from the different responses of the people who were there as Jesus once again calls order out of chaos. So let's pick the story back up where we left off last time at Mark chapter 5 and we'll begin by reading the first 13 verses. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. And no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains. But he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. If you were here last week... 
you'll remember that Jesus and his disciples encountered a life-threatening storm, what Mark called a megastorm on their way across the Sea of Galilee, a trip they were taking at least in part to get a break from the massive crowds of people who were following them everywhere they went. And you'll remember from those previous stories that the crowds had become so large and so overbearing that uh, to date, uh, let's see, a, a hole was torn in the roof of the house Jesus and his disciples were staying in, probably Peter's house, in chapter 2, verse 4. Preparing meals had become impossible to the point they couldn't even take time to eat, chapter 3, verse 20. His family decided that Jesus had lost his mind, chapter 3, verse 21. The religious Jews decided he was possessed by Satan, chapter 3, verse 22. They had to get into a boat off the shore of the sea when Jesus preached just to keep from literally getting crushed by the crowds of people, chapter 3, verse 9, and chapter 4, verse 1. And so finally, in order to get a break from what must have been a, a constant and unbearable amount of pressure from every direction, they, they leave in the boat hungry, exhausted, just looking for a little respite. And yet, as they travel across the Sea of Galilee, they encounter this storm that nearly kills them, which, of course, means at this point, there's been no rest, no food, no let up on the pressure. In fact, if anything, it's gotten worse on the trip over until finally they land on the other side of the Sea of Galilee near a small town named Gerasa, or what uh, the renowned first century scholar Origen also uh, the third century historian Eusebius both would refer to as Gergesa on the eastern side of the lake where surely Jesus and his disciples would be able to get something to eat and escape the crowds and take a much needed time of rest and replenishment except for the fact that the moment Jesus steps out of the boat immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. And for the disciples, this was about as bad as it could get because now not only are they utterly exhausted, famished with hunger, nerves completely raw from the stress of the storm and frightened out of their minds just having watched Jesus command the very elements of nature. But now... Now they have to contend with the naked man, according to Luke's account of this same story, who was possessed by an unclean spirit, which was a much bigger deal for these Jewish men than you might think. Because to a Jew, the very worst thing that could happen to you was to be deemed ceremonially, ceremonially unclean, according to God's law. Uh, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy are full of laws and regulations and elaborate procedures for mitigating ceremonial uncleanness, which was exacerbated, uh, made even more difficult by the fact that later rabbinic tradition greatly expanded the rules for dealing with ceremonial uncleanness. And so what used to require seven days of purification rites when a Jew touched a dead body now included touching anything that the dead body touched or was even associated with like the wooden planks that the body was transported on or uh, a gravestone or a mattress a pillow a tomb and on and on and on and worse than all of those things was actually coming into contact for a Jew with an unclean spirit and so here we have this man first of all who had an unclean spirit. Second, he lived among the tombs, which at this uh, location, by the way, were open caves, not sealed tombs. So anyone in them would be in immediate proximity to dead bodies and everything that goes along with that. Uh, Numbers 19, 11 through 14 says that anyone who failed to purify himself from contact with tombs must be cut off from Israel. Third, the man was from Decapolis, as we'll see, which is literally translated from the Greek as ten cities. So Decapolis was this region which, according uh, to Pliny the Elder, a first century Roman author and army commander in the early Roman Empire, he said it was comprised of Damascus, Philadelphia, Raphana, Scythopolis, Gadara, Hippos, Dios, Pella, Gerasa, and Kathana. The, the point being, these were all Gentile territories, right, which were considered unclean to even be there by the Jews, which is where this man was from. And then finally, 
To add insult to injury, the man lived near pigs. Again, as we'll see, which were considered unclean by the Hebrew people. Now, think about these disciples. Just put yourself in their sandals for a moment. Imagine their horror as they finally reached the other shore after faithfully and obediently doing God's work, worn out and spent in just about every way possible, and now they're being violently confronted by a man who is unclean in just about every way possible. If I'm a disciple at this point, I don't get to eat, I don't get to rest, I don't get to settle my nerves, and now on top of all of that, if this naked, crazy, crazed, possessed man gets near me, I have to figure out how I'm going to separate myself from my own people for seven days in order to honor the purification rites according to God's law and my own religious tradition. Someone asked me last week if the disciples even got out of the boat at this point, which of course the text doesn't tell us, and yet as badly as they must have wanted out of that boat after the night they just spent on the Sea of Galilee, I wouldn't be surprised at all to find out that they hunkered down in that boat as Jesus stepped out to confront this wildly possessed, unclean Gentile. Right? If, if this was any one of us, we would have turned that boat around right then and there and started back across that lake, but not Jesus. He always confronts chaos with order, and that's what he does here. He meets the unclean man head on as the demons possessing the man, according to Matthew's account of the story, asked Jesus this question, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Back in chapter one, where Jesus first casts out a demon, we talked about the fact that in the ancient Near East, exorcists and exorcisms were quite common actually as recorded in many of the ancient writings we have including the Qumran the, the Dead Sea Scrolls where there's an incantation formula that was specifically designed to exorcise demons we've also discovered lists of names written out as incantations in the magical papri these ancient books that contained spells for casting out demons to aid the exorcist in figuring out the name of the demon so that he could take authority over. You see, it was uh, widely held at the time that if the exorcist could discern and then pronounce or call out the name of the demon, that he would gain authority over that evil spirit. So these demons possessing the man from the tombs, just like the demon in chapter 1, are actually trying to gain authority over Jesus by calling out his divine name, Son of the Most High God. Of course, it doesn't work because Jesus has all authority over every spirit. And so realizing they couldn't take authority over Jesus, the demons continue, I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Luke's account adding, adds that the, the demons specifically asked Jesus not to send them into the abyss, which they knew, of course, they were destined for eventually, which would mean eternal torment. And so Jesus turns the tables and asks the demon for his name, to which they reply, my name is Legion, for we are many. And although a Roman uh, legion at the time, at least at full strength, consisted of 6,000 soldiers, in the uh, popular uh, vernacular of the first century, the term legion was often used to describe any really large host, not necessarily the specific number. The, the point being, whatever the actual number was, this man was clearly possessed by thousands of demons, which we see later in the story when the pigs come into play thousands of demons who were by giving Jesus, by giving him a generic description, an informal name of themselves instead of their actual names, they were attempting to keep him from gaining authority over them. It's a bit of a spiritual chess match, even though they must have known better, as evidenced by the next time they speak. You see, they knew that even without their names, Jesus still had authority over them, and so they begin to beg him, as Mark describes it, to let them enter a herd of pigs nearby, which was not uh, unheard of in ancient times. I was just reading this week a story in uh, chapter 8 of the book of Tobias, which is not biblical literature, but certainly ancient historical literature that is included in the Dead Sea Scrolls, by the way. And in that story, the demon was cast out of a young woman and sent off into another region. So this type of response by the legion of demons in our story was not totally 
unheard of, but more importantly, this is the first of three responses to Jesus calling order out of chaos that we find in our story today. This first being, of course, hostility against Christ. It's the very picture of how evil responds to the authority of Christ every single time. Defiant to the bitter end. It's the same way all those who are under the control of the prince of the power of the air, as the Apostle Paul put it in Ephesians 2.2, it's the same way they respond to the authority of Christ today. Listen, those who openly reject Jesus, who oppose His Spirit and His Word and His church, just look at what's happening today among the social and political and religious movements that are at enmity with Christ and His purposes for this world. It seems... It seems that the clearer and stronger his word is on a particular issue, the more defiant the world is in opposition to his word. Right? The Bible could not be any clearer in emphasizing the sanctity of human life. The fact that we're made in the image of God alone should make us shudder at the thought of willfully taking the innocent life of another human being. And yet from 1973 to today, our government has put its stamp of approval on putting to death over 50 million innocent unborn children. From the sanctity of life, to the covenant of marriage, to the message of the gospel, to the very identity of who God created us to be. We are attempting to redefine everything that is immutably and eternally sacred, holy, and pleasing to God. Yet listen, none of this should surprise us, right? Because the opposition to Christ that we're experiencing in the world today is as old as that ancient serpent who tempted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. This is simply the world being the world. And therefore, it is precisely what we should expect from people who are desperately lost without Christ, living their lives under the relentless spiritual chaos of this world, from which we know, of course, there's only one way out, through Jesus Christ alone. And so these demons actually ask the right question, what have you to do with me? The problem for the demons was their fate was already sealed, and they knew it. And so with all the sincerity and passion they could muster, they begged Jesus to let them enter the pigs nearby, because anything was better than the eternal torment of hell. And so he lets them go, knowing their fate was already sealed. But listen, this is not so with the billions of men and women who are still living under the spiritual chaos of this world. As long as their hearts are still beating, there's still hope for them. And notice, when Jesus confronted the demon-possessed man, he didn't rattle off every terrible thing that that man must have done to invite that many demons into his life. No, the moment the man fell on his knees in submission to Christ's created order for his life, Jesus simply took authority over that chaos by speaking the truth, and then he set the man free. Listen, there is, there is most certainly a place for Christians to judge one another in love within the body of Christ for the sake of accountability. It's made very clear in Scripture. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13 is just one example of that. But look, we're not to judge the world. You understand, that's not our job. When those who are living under the spiritual chaos of this world are hostile against Christ and His Word and His people, listen, don't get offended at the world. No, get offended at the enemy. And then do something about it. Instead of proclaiming judgment over people's lives, proclaim order over their chaos by speaking the truth, by speaking the gospel in love into their lives. And you understand how how they respond to that order, to that truth? Well, that part isn't up to you. Your job is simply to ask the question, Jesus, what have you to do with me? And then prepare yourself for the answer, because the answer will always involve you speaking order over the chaos in this world by proclaiming the gospel to those who have yet to receive it. 
leads us to the next part of the story. Let's read verses 14 through 17. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. So as you would expect... Those who witnessed what Jesus had just done flee into the city and the surrounding countryside to tell everyone they can find what had just happened. And as a result, people from everywhere begin to show up to see it for themselves. These Gentiles all want to get closer to Jesus to see what he's capable of until the moment they witness firsthand just what being close to Jesus actually looks like. You see, not only was the demon-possessed man finally free, finally clothed, finally in his right mind, the effect that Jesus had on this man was dramatic and undeniable as he brought order out of chaos into the man's life. But listen, it's also true that there were 2,000 dead pigs at the bottom of that hill. By the way, uh, just as a side note, over the years, People have taken issue with Jesus doing something that would cause thousands of animals to die, which is arguable in the first place because it was the demons that drove the pigs into the sea. And yet, listen, even if it was, even if it was Jesus' intention to destroy those animals, 2,000 pigs is a small price to pay for a human soul. You see, the redemptive work of Christ in the man's life was undeniable, but so was the disruptive work of Christ in their business as usual lifestyle, and it upset them terribly. Right? Hey, if we let him stay, what other drastic changes will Jesus bring about in our lives? What else are we going to have to give up? What else will we lose if we let him stay? And so as a result, they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. With the same sincerity and the same passion as the legion of demons, these Gentiles try to convince Jesus to leave. They don't try to take authority over Jesus or to defeat him in any way. In fact, they're fine with the existence of Jesus in other people's lives. They just don't want him in their own lives. And so they beg him to leave them alone. It's the second response in our story to Jesus calling order out of chaos as the crowd of people showed their resistance toward Christ. What they should have done upon witnessing both his redemptive and disruptive work in their lives was ask the question, Jesus, what have you to do with me? And yet the hard reality is most people are actually okay with Jesus working in other people's lives as long as that work doesn't affect their own lives. And unfortunately, this is not just true of unbelievers. The fact is, there are a lot of Christians who are happy to accept the redemptive work of Christ in their lives, but wholly unwilling to accept the disruptive work in their lives. You see, at the end of the day, these Gentiles were more comfortable with the legion of demons than they were with Jesus. They cared more about their pigs than they did about their fellow human beings. And I just wonder, what have we grown comfortable with in our own lives that we're not willing to allow Jesus to disrupt? I personally believe this is one of the most prevalent problems in the American church today. Our resistance to the disruptive work of Christ in our lives. And so instead of asking Jesus... What have you to do with me? We resist the leading of his voice and the teaching of his word and the accountability of his church because we're not really interested in our business as usual lifestyle being disrupted because we like things how they are. We're comfortable with the status quo. We don't really want change, but I'm telling you, submitting to Christ's created order for your life means allowing him to disrupt business as usual. In fact, it may mean losing some things that you hold dear. It may mean a new reality in how you live your daily life. In fact, it may mean significant changes in business as usual. But honestly, isn't it worth it? 
for far too long. Too much of the American church has fostered and promoted this idea of what it means to be a Christian that requires little from us and yet demands much for us. And the result is we resist the work of Christ in our lives any time it looks like it might disrupt business as usual because we don't think we should have to go through difficulty or disruption in order to follow Jesus. Listen, I hate to be the one to break it to you. But the fact is, Jesus will gladly disrupt your life. Gladly, in order to accomplish his purposes in you and in this world through you, as he continues to ever call order out of the spiritual chaos in people's lives. So you understand Christ created order for your life and his disruptive work in your life are not mutually exclusive ideas. In fact, they go hand in hand because sometimes Jesus has to upset the apple cart in your life to get you to abandon business as usual and go where he wants you to go and do what he wants you to do. For our part, we simply need to be continually asking the question, Jesus, what have you to do with me? And then don't be surprised or resistant when he disrupts business as usual. Because even in the disruption, he's calling order out of chaos. Let's finish the story for today. Verses 18 through 20. As he was getting in the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him Uh, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. And so as Jesus prepares to leave, which we'll come back to in a moment, there's one more person in, in the story who begs him to do something for them. The demons begged him to let them possess the pigs. The townspeople begged him to leave their region. And now the previously possessed man who has been set free by Jesus begs him to take him with them on the boat. He is desperate to be with Christ. And yet of all three requests, this is the only one that Jesus does not honor. He gives the demons what they want. He gives the townspeople what they want. But the one person who says yes to Jesus, the only person who isn't hostile or resistant toward him, is the one person whose request is refused. Why is that? Well, the Apostle John said, if we ask anything according to his will, according to to his will, according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. It's simple, really. This man was now a believer and a follower of Christ, and yet what he was begging Jesus for was simply not the will of God for his life. Can you see how already... Jesus was disrupting this man's plans for his own life. His plan was to go with Jesus and join the band of 12 disciples. In fact, if you read this man's request in verse 18 to be with Jesus, if you read it in the original Greek, it's the exact same phrase as the one Mark uses in chapter 3, verse 14 to describe Jesus' call to those original disciples. Clearly, this man's plan was to become one of those disciples who traveled with Jesus. The only problem was that was not Christ's created order for this man's life. Why? Because Jesus had a different plan, one where the man went back to his homeland, the region of Decapolis, to spread the gospel. And as a result, not only did he become the first Gentile missionary with incredible effect in that region, but centuries later, we are still telling his story, which is still turning people's hearts to Christ. Now you tell me, Was it worth a little disruption in his life? You bet it was. This is the epitome 
of asking Jesus, what have you to do with me? And then responding favorably to the answer, even when that answer is not what you want to hear. And it all comes back to the man's response to Jesus calling order out of chaos in his life. It's the third response to Jesus in our story, and it's the one that we really need to pay attention to because as a result of what Jesus has done for this man, the man responds with a desperation for Christ. And listen, anything less than pure desperation for Jesus and his work in your life, even his disruptive work, anything less than pure desperation for Christ will inevitably become a form of resistance toward him. Because look, if you're not desperate for Christ, you will never follow him to all the places and people and circumstances that he wants to lead you to in your lifetime. Never. Why? Because his created order Listen, Christ's created order for your life is far too disruptive. It is far too challenging. It is far too risky. It is far too dangerous. Listen, Jesus' plan for your life is far too costly for you to even attempt it without a desperation for Him. And so we love to ask deep questions as long as the answers don't cost us anything. It's also why more Christians aren't asking Jesus, what have you to do with me? Because we're more comfortable with business as usual than we are with this created order for our lives. And the the result is generations of God's people, His church, gathering together to talk about how much we want to impact the world for Christ while we're resisting His call to go and impact the world for Christ. Because we're not desperate for Jesus. We're for Him. We're just not desperate for Him. And so I I just think maybe it's time we stop talking. Maybe it's time to start listening. Which begins when we ask the question, Jesus, what have you to do with me? And then we wait. We wait quietly, expectantly, and desperately for him to answer. You understand, anything less than that is resistance. And there's only one person responsible for the resistance toward Christ in your life, and that is you. (laughs) Look, the, the storm of the century, the one that nearly sunk his boat couldn't stop Jesus from coming to Decapolis. And then a possessed man who could not be restrained, even by shackles and chains, could not stop Jesus from coming to Decapolis. And then a legion of demons, thousands of demons who tried to usurp his authority and overcome him, could not stop Jesus from coming to Decapolis. But the moment the townspeople resist him, the moment they ask him to leave, he gets back in the boat and leaves. You understand, Jesus didn't violate their will. And if you resist him, well, he won't violate yours either. The fact is, the only person who can keep you from living the life that God created you to live is you. But listen to me, if you will quiet your spirit and simply listen for his voice in your life, you will hear him calling you, calling you out of spiritual chaos into his created order for your life. It will surely be disruptive at times and it may not always look like you want it to, but when you're desperate enough for Jesus to answer that call in your life, no matter what it is, your life will impact this world for generations to come. And it all starts 
with a simple question. Jesus, what have you to do with me? Let's pray.